Hello and welcome to Holy Habits Online Home Group number four. A special hello if you're just joining us and a special thank you if you've been with us since the beginning. It's so good to be able to share together in new ways in these days when we might otherwise be apart. There was a very interesting piece by Harriet Sherwood on the Guardian website on the 3rd of May which said this, a quarter of adults in the UK have watched or listened to a religious service since the coronavirus lockdown began. And one in 20 have started praying during the crisis. And this is according to a new survey by Tear Fund. The findings of the poll, according to Harriet, reinforce indications of an increase in the number of people turning to faith for succour amidst uncertainty and despair. And just to add to that, a large proportion of these people were younger adults. These are interesting times, with hope amidst the suffering and despair, lament and celebration intermingled. Let's pause to pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather together, we thank you for these signs of good news amidst the challenges of these times. We do pray that you would continue to guide us as your people, as to how we can be caring and compassionate, how we can share the gifts and resources that you have given to us, and how that with all good people of peace, we may build a better world in the days to come. Bless us and guide us in our time together in this session, we pray, and we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so far in our series on sharing resources, we thought about sharing practical and emotional resources and how offering a little to the Lord can achieve disproportionate results. In this session, we're going to think about what really matters, and we're going to explore an idea which is emerging, called the Sacrament of Friendship. For our biblical text this evening, I'm reading from Mark chapter 10 and verses 17 to 31. Again, a familiar passage. Uh, This is often called the story of the rich young ruler. Mark chapter 10 from verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honour your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all of these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples are amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With people this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up. We have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. 
commenting on this passage in the Holy Habits Bible Reflection series, Veronica Zundel points out that for many at the time of Jesus, personal wealth was a sign of righteousness, a reward for good behaviour. But as Veronica goes on to point out, Jesus turns the thinking of his day on its head. Wealth, she says, can be an obstacle to entering God's kingdom. These are not easy words for those of us in the affluent West to hear. We still often define ourselves by what we own, and it can get in the way of radical dependence on God. The kingdom is a place of sharing, but the more we have, the less willing we may be to share. At bottom, this is a spiritual issue. If all our security is in possessions, what need do we have of God or of each other? I need to hear this myself, says Veronica, for I struggle to live more simply. My only hope, she says, is Jesus looking at him, loved him. Veronica's words are really helpful and challenging for those of us able to make choices. But we must never forget that there are many in our world for whom thinking about living more simply is not a matter of choice or something to do during a time of lockdown. Those in poverty, those in prison, those critically ill with any illness, not just COVID-19, don't have the luxury of choice. But how often do we find that it is such people who discover heaven on earth, embodying the Beatitudes that Jesus celebrated in the Sermon on the Mount? I was privileged to know one such person, a lady called Joy, one of the most wonderful human beings I have ever met. Joy was orphaned as a young child. After basic schooling, she began work in a laundry before going on to various cleaning jobs. She never married and lived in a small council bungalow with her cat. In worldly terms, she achieved very little. In kingdom terms, she achieved, sorry, she achieved much more than most of us. Like St Paul, many years before, she learnt the art of contentment. One day I visited her in her home and found her with two friends contentedly listening to the radio and enjoying a big pot of tea. If I'd given them a million pounds, they could not have been any happier. Joy was faithful in prayer, reading the Bible, worship and fellowship. And like the widow commended by Jesus, she gave generously of her time and financial resources. Her purse was always open when there was a charitable event or a disaster appeal, and her cleaning skills kept the chapel spotless. Joy taught me so much. Before I met her, I'd never been very comfortable with the Good News Bible's use of the word happy rather than blessed in the Beatitudes of Jesus, until the day Joy showed me the happiness of being blessed, even when suffering. As she lay in a hospice bed, she looked at me and said, Andrew, I'm so happy. Almost invisible due to cancer, but translucent with joy, this saintly lady was so happy to have enjoyed her life. She was happy for the care and love of friends old and new, and so, so happy at the prospect of being with Jesus soon. The happiest person I have ever met. In many ways, Joy had absolutely nothing, but in ways that really matter, she had everything. I wonder what you make of the story of the rich young ruler. For me, this is a story that challenges me to think about what really matters. And this is a challenge that positively and helpfully many are thinking through in these days, of course. Now, ultimately, we may want to say that it's the kingdom of God that matters or following Jesus or doing God's will. I wouldn't argue with any of these. But within these big picture or meta narrative responses, I wonder what else you would add. When we get to our Q&A time, it will be really good to hear some of your thoughts on this. 
For a moment, I'd like to invite you to think about a quote I came across at about the time that the coronavirus was starting to take hold. It comes from the American Presbyterian writer Eugene Peterson, who wrote the message translation, The Bible. He said this, Friendship is a much underestimated aspect of spirituality. It's every bit as significant as prayer and fasting. Like the sacramental use of water and bread and wine, friendship takes what's common in human experience and turns it into something holy. I like that a lot. It's so simple, but so eloquent. Friendship is a much underestimated aspect of spirituality. It's every bit as significant as prayer and fasting, like the sacramental use of water and bread and wine. Friendship takes what's common in human experience and turns it into something holy. As followers of Jesus, we are called to friendship with him. John 15 verse 15, I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I've called you friends because I've made known to you everything that I've heard from my father. We are called to be friends with one another too. And we are called to be friends with the fabric of creation that we are part of. And again, how much are we discovering about these callings in these days? Ask anyone what they're missing most at the moment. And my guess is being with my friends, hanging out with them, hugging them, having coffee with them, would be high up on most people's lists. At the same time, the friendship of the postman or the binman or the loyal colleague who helps us to work at home is being appreciated more than ever. These things really matter. I really like Peterson's comprehensive understanding of spirituality and sacramentality. Note that Peterson doesn't undervalue prayer or fasting or the specific dominical sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion. Rather, he suggests that friendship is every bit as much a spiritual and sacramental practice as these other things. To be a true friend, is to be a holy thing. And it is part of what it is to be fully human, made in the image of God. To be a true friend is to be an outward sign of an inward grace. In other words, it is to be sacramental. And talking of sacraments, there is a lot of debate at the moment about the can and can'ts and should and shouldn'ts of Holy Communion at home. In the Holy Habits passage, Acts 2, 42 to 47, Luke says in verse 46 that they broke bread at home. I invite you to ponder what this verse may have to say to us, and in particular what it may say about different ways and contexts in which we can appropriately and legitimately break bread together. And let me just say that when it comes to breaking bread and the ways it can be done, there will be a range of understandings depending upon our traditions and theological perspectives. One specific context in which we break bread together is, of course, that of the celebration of Holy Communion in our particular denominations and traditions. And here I would always encourage people to honour the practices of the fellowship they belong to. As we head towards a close, I'd like to share my favourite Holy Habits story. Some of you will have heard it before. It features a good friend of mine, Indigit Bogle, who I should point out is ordained and is a former president of the British Methodist Conference. It's a story that celebrates the sacrament of friendship and has breaking bread at its heart. This is Indigit's story of the day he met Albert. Albert is homeless. He says people call him a tramp and sometimes give him money. He lives on the streets of Sheffield where I've got to know him well. As a walker, he gave me sound advice as I prepared to walk along roads from Sheffield to London. 
I saw him recently. He was sitting on a concrete bench in the city centre. He had a bandage around his head. I banged into a wall, he said. As we got into conversation, I asked him to help me. I'm working on a sermon about tables and bread and parties in the wilderness, I said. It seems a bit odd, but can you help me? I love bread, he said. He reached into a carrier bag beside him. His boots and walking stick were by the bag. Out of the bag, he fetched bread. I always have bread, he said. I know a shop. I turn up just before closing time. They give me a couple of loaves. With it, I feed myself and my brothers and sisters who are poor. He talked to me about all those homeless ones who walk at night as others sleep. He held out a large round cob. This is made from rye. I love it. My favourite, he said. Try some. He broke off a large piece with his rugged hands and held it out to me. I received it and said, Amen, and ate it in bits over several minutes. As I ate it, he unpacked his carrier bag and brought out different kinds of bread and placed it all on the concrete slab bench, which had now become a table. Suddenly, I was having a meal, and he was the host. Each loaf was held up and its contents were described. I was given a piece from each loaf. You need good red wine with this bread. It will be a good one for your communion at church. You need to eat this bread with cheese. All around us, a city centre environment with its own beauty. But a wilderness with a lifestyle of grabbing and greed and of profit before people. People racing about some sitting down to rest. Before me a parable of the text, a table in the wilderness. I was being fed by one of the poorest people I know. I was a guest of honour at a table in the wilderness. You treat me like an honoured guest, I said. Let's just be quiet for a moment. Let's reflect on that amazing story of Albert and Indigit. Let's think about how friendship can be a sacrament an outward sign of an inward grace. And let's ask God to remind us again in these days of both challenge and wonder what truly, really matters. Lord, we are humbled when we think of people like Joy and people like Albert with so very, very little of the riches, apparent riches and resources of this world and yet so rich in ways that truly matter. Forgive us, we pray, when we, like the rich young ruler, can be distracted and bound by the possessions that we have. Thank you for the things that we are learning in these days about what really matters. Thank you today for the gift of friendship, so precious, as precious as water and bread and wine. May we live more simply, may we live more faithfully, not just in these times of immediate crisis, but in the future that emerges too. 
For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for watching. In a moment we will go live with our Q&A session. Just a reminder that if you'd like to join this, you need to stop watching this video at the end and return to the Holy Habits Home Group Facebook page. You can do this by pressing the white arrow at the top left of the screen. Then find and click on the video that says Andrew Roberts is live when this is appears. Again, we'll do some opening greetings just to give you time to transition and join us. And then when uh, we seem to be there, we will uh, explore some questions. And these will be our questions for this session. Number one, what have you missed about not being able to physically meet your friends? And what new friendships have you formed or appreciated in these days? Number two, what have you learnt about re what really matters from people like Joy who do not have the luxury of choices that others of us might take for granted? Number three, what do you make of Eugene Peterson's quote? Friendship is a much underestimated aspect of spirituality, every bit as significant as prayer and fasting. Like the sacramental use of water and bread and wine, friendship takes what's common in human experience and turns it into something holy. Number four, what was going on in the story of Albert and Indigit? And what do we learn from this? And can I just add again that when it comes to breaking bread and the ways it can be done, one way, of course, being in the context of Holy Communion, there will be a range of understandings depending upon our traditions and theological perspectives. And then question five, would you agree that friendship is a high expression of discipleship? And with whom should that friendship be? So there are questions that we'll explore in a moment. Next week, we'll be focusing on the problem of selfishness, the antithesis of sharing resources. Our biblical passages will be Acts 5, 1 to 4, the story of Ananias and Sapphira, and Deuteronomy 24, 19 to 22, with its instructions to leave things for others. As ever, if you have helpful stories that can be shared, do let us have them via the email address holyhabits at brf.org.uk. And until next time, or the live session which will follow, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.